In this digital age, where possibilities and opportunities seem unlimited, the line between companies who are actually pioneers and the companies who may be left behind can roughly be defined by three critical elements. Having the right strategy, having appetite for innovation, and having good governance in place. And that's exactly what the Accelerator Panel will discuss today. Please welcome on stage my colleague Paul Allen and his panelists, Nicola O'Connor, Caroline Gorski, and Jason Miles. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Paul Allen. I'm a partner at DLA Piper based in Dubai, and I have the pleasure and privilege of heading up our intellectual property and technology group internationally. And as Hannah just mentioned there, we're going to be talking about the interplay between governance, innovation, and strategy in today's technology fuel environment. So our esteemed panelists for this session are Nicola O'Connor. Nicola is the Deputy CTO and Chief Information Security and IT Risk Officer at AIB. Welcome. We also have Caroline Gorski, CEO of Capital Enterprise the UK's leading startup support network. And Carolyn was also a contributor to our Embracing Digital Evolution report a couple of years ago. Thank you again for that. Mm -hmm. And finally, Jason Moles. Jason is the CEO and co-founder of Surgenex, which is focused on innovation in neonatal brain monitoring technology. Thank you. So great to have you all with us. Let's get straight into it. So innovation across sectors and across the globe um, is being fueled by data, machine learning, and very powerful computers. And so, Carolyn, maybe starting with you, just how much of an imperative is innovation to an organization and its strategy? I mean, you would expect me to say absolutely critical, given that my job is to support innovation uh, across the UK as an economy, particularly focusing on some of the most innovative small challenger businesses that we're, we're hoping to grow there. Um, you heard Minister Coveney talk this morning about how critically important innovation is for the Irish economy, um, for growing the capacity of Irish businesses to, to compete um, and to be able to take their place on the global stage. We've seen over the last little while uh, some really challenging situations, both as large organisations and as small organisations. It has caused something of a retrenchment in both the capacity and the appetite to invest in cutting edge innovation. But from my perspective, now is the time to double down on those investments because the organizations who get themselves ahead of the curve, the organizations who can come out of this downturn, having done some of the hard yards to understand the disruption that's coming to their business models and the opportunities they have to take new competitive positions will grow faster when the upturn comes. And that's critically important. You want your sales to be up a tiny little bit ahead of the wind, guys. Because that way you win the race. Hmm. So double down on innovation, now's the right time to do that. Nicola, do you agree? Yes, absolutely. Um, so when you look at it from an Irish market point of view, we're probably one of the most accelerated economies in terms of digital adoption. Um, we've got a, a young population. They're very active in terms of digital uh, penetration. We can see it even from the way that our customers engage with from an app point of view. So our about 80% of our customers engage with our app on a daily basis. So you can see the amount of activity that's going on. So it's, it's so ingrained in the way that people live their lives, how they engage, et cetera, and that kind of thing. So to be ahead in terms of that digital age, you need innovation. You're always looking for the better customer experience. You're always looking for the better penetration into people's lives, et cetera, and that kind of thing. That doesn't come naturally without innovation. So. I think innovation is needed for every business to grow. Um, we can see it in every part of our economy. Great, thank you. And Jason, your business is pretty much founded and you know, business, innovation is at the, at the core of your business model. It'd be great to hear a little bit about Sogenex and you know, how innovation plays a critical role for you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, at Sogenex, we're, we're developing uh, a newborn brain system to test infants at birth for, for abnormal brain activity. Um, and the idea is that it's, it's a product that can be used by non-specialists, so everybody in this room could be trained to use it, uh, and it gives a very simple pass or refer result, and the refer result would mean that um, there, there's a possibility of abnormal brain injury, and that child requires further um, investigation by the medical team on standby. So 
in, in terms of innovation, yes, you know, innovation is key. We're, we're using, in some ways, quite old technology. It's electroencephalogram or EEG, but we're combining that with an automated AI assessment. So we've got lots and lots of data, and we're building a, the AI assessment then to determine the, the, the pass or a fair result. So I suppose our strategy as a company is probably built around kind of three core pillars. Uh, innovation being a key part of it. Um, adaptability and flexibility, and then customer, customer centricity. And by customer centricity, I, I suppose I mean probably more the ecosystem, um, you know, which includes not just kind of hospitals and neonatologists, but, you know, uh, the FDA, the CE from a regulatory perspective, uh, insurers in the US and so on. So it's, it's very vast. So for us, it's about being able to pivot, being able to be, be, be adapt and move quickly. Um, and innovation has to be uh, at the heart of, of everything we do. And it's also very prevalent in, in med tech and, and newer tech in general. So you, you can see the way the market's moving. You can see where, you know, once there were, you know, very fine kind of med tech devices that were out there and they still are out there, um, but they're kind of static from a data perspective. And it's the devices now that have the ability to, uh, like a ventilator, for example, the ability to capture that data and put it in the cloud so that then, you know, it can be evolved and generate further AI then, which can then in turn be embedded in the product and, you know, innovate from there. So innovation is, is absolutely essential. And, and, and it's not just, you hear these words, and I saw some of those words flashed on the screen, they're not those words, you know, they're very real. And, and you've got to kind of continually, you know, pivot and move and be agile and flexible because things are changing all the time. Maybe just sticking with you, because your, your journey is quite interesting uh, of how Surgenics was, was born, so to speak. So could you talk, talk us a little bit through that, you know, the, the journey of Surgenix? Yeah, I suppose the, the, the journey of Surgenix is, uh, my background is, is, is uh, more in, in the banking, uh, financing and commercial space. Um, but um, one of my co-founders was um, his uh, sibling set up the Infant Research Centre in University College Cork. And that's a research centre which is dedicated to um, research around uh, pregnancy, birth and, and early childhood. Uh, and she had, you know, years and years and years of, of research on EEG, uh, EEG recordings on, on both healthy infants and infants then with, you know, uh, abnormal brain function. Um, and research is one thing, but actually trying to commercialize a product and get it out there into the real world is, is, is a completely different thing. So the kind of genesis of, of Surgenics is very much founded in that where Sean, who's our CTO, and I were looking in and going, well, you know, maybe we could help here. The skills we have across the three of us, you know, we should be able to kind of uh, bring the commercial skills, the technology skills, and, and the scientific skills together. Uh, we formed the company, and we've we, we've built a device now. We're moving into kind of pilot uh, early next year, uh, functionality and pilot. So that that's that's the genesis and background to it. So it is, it's quite an interesting story. Fantastic. And Caroline, you have a, a big role to play uh, in the UK startup scene. Yeah, so Capital Enterprises, um, it's kind of a bit like the glue, I guess, that sticks together various uh, large-scale interventions across the UK economy uh, to help uh, grow new businesses, particularly businesses uh, started by founders from unrepresented groups. So over the last 10 years, we've supported about 5,500 founders um, to, to build their businesses in the UK. About 3,500 of those come from underrepresented communities. So they are women, they come from the BAME community, they come from areas outside of London. Um, and we have a 20% raise rate from that group. Uh, so all told, about 1,000 of them have raised somewhere around £2.8 billion pounds worth in early stage or follow-on funding. Um, and, and that covers, they, they are, for the most part, technology startups. We, we build interventions designed around our members. We have a, a, a wide range of members as part of our organization who come from academia, they come from the technology community, they come from corporate partners, they come from the public sector. They're interested in, in building out innovation for economic return. Either they want to develop their region or they want to see innovation happen in a particular industry sector. We do a, a really interesting program of work with the Cancer Research um, organization in the UK focused on cancer tech uh, acceleration, which we've now successfully been running for three years. Um, and that's because Cancer Research UK wants to stimulate innovation in new methods of diagnosing, treating, and being able to, to cure cancer. Um, and actually having somebody like Capital Enterprise designing and staging those interventions, bringing together the ecosystem that can make them to be, can make them successful, and particularly help those organizations to get through the very challenging phases from having a brilliant idea and a great opportunity to, to investigate and, and understand the need for that idea to being 
funding ready, right, to getting to the point where they can sit in front of an investment committee from a VC and feel really confident that they're going to get the check that they need to invest in the development work that they have to do. Because in many of the sectors we specialize in, artificial intelligence, deep tech, med tech, uh, clean tech, you've got a long development cycle that requires patient capital that can be invested yeah. for a period of time. Mm, absolutely. And, and Nicola, in the, in the bank, you, your strategies around innovation, do they involve the startup community or how do you see the, the startup community and your relationship with them? No, they absolutely do involve it. Um, and there's kind of two sides to it. So we're obviously very involved in terms of the funding and we work with um, a number of funds and actually part of the engagement with that fund is, is getting knowledge. So it's actually being part of, you know, some of their testing conversations, et cetera, some of their exploratory activity. And obviously ours is predominantly banking that we're talking about or financial services or customer experience. But you are getting insight into some of those funds and you're getting insight in terms of that early tech kind of capability. And when Caroline and I spoke last week, I suppose it was really interesting seeing both sides of the story because we're looking at it from an interest point of view. So what, what is different? What's a USP for us? And if you think about it from a banking point of view, a lot of your back-end technology is fairly standard. It's becoming quite monolithic yeah. across the globe, obviously very cloud oriented in the last couple of years, et cetera, and that kind of thing. But it's not a major differentiator point. The differentiator point is actually on the customer experience. And that's really where you want to be slightly innovative, engaging your customers, et cetera, and that kind of thing. So that's so we pick and choose where we invest because the burden to bring a fintech into a regulated entity is actually quite high. Yeah. Um, because if you think about it, you have to show three to five years worth of financial um, throughput, et cetera. You have to be able to show that you've got you know, a very strong data protection, data ethics kind of program. You have to be able to show that you've got all the third party capabilities, et cetera, and that kind of stuff. Mm. So that's a very big burden for a fintech. Um, and I, I think there's lots of supports need to be given to organizations to get into that point. Because from our perspective, we don't want to always have to deal with just the monolithics, because therefore you're never going to get that USP. Absolutely. You need to be able to work with the startup community to get access to the innovation because that's where the innovation is really taking place. Yeah. But you talked about the burden there and the burden, of course, has the relationship with risk. So let's talk about risk for a little bit here because we're talking about machine learning. We're talking about big data. We're talking about powerful interconnected com computing. What are the risks associated with the innovation that you're carrying out or that you're seeing carried out that you know, are really important for the audience to hear about today? Well, my previous role to this role was as the head of Rolls-Royce's um, Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning Unit. And when I say Rolls-Royce, I don't mean the luxury cars, I mean the engine manufacturing organization. Um, and so that similarly to the financial services sector or to the med tech environment is a, is, a, is a sector in which we are looking at the development of innovations and new technologies to develop business processes and decision making, sometimes completely automated decision making in what could be a safety critical setting, mm -hmm. right? So rightly, that's highly regulated. There are, of course, risks with introducing very disruptive, very new, very novel technology technologies into safety critical, highly regulated sectors. But the way to address those risks, I fundamentally believe, is in, is in acknowledging that the, the way that you reduce risk in the development of a really, really good artificial intelligence model is by presenting that model with really clean, really effective data that is domain precise. And most of that data doesn't sit in startup universe world. Mm. It sits with the big corporations. It may not be in a very usable state right now. It does very much depend on how well the corporation has taken its own data management responsibilities. But we have to find a way, I think, of bringing those two universes together, where large corporations can, in an entrusted way, with the right regulations and safety in, in place, start to make their data available so that those innovations that the startups are beginning to build are less risky. Hmm. That we, we actually drive some of the, the risk that the regulatory environment is seeking to contain out of those models much earlier on in the process. Because we will get our innovations into market faster, we will be able to trust them much more, and ultimately we'll be able to achieve the outcomes we want in terms of doing things like coming up with new cures for cancer or 
you know, developing techniques that help us to understand whether a newborn has a brain injury or not. Yeah. Well, what about from your perspective, Jason, uh, the, the data and the, having the, the clean yeah. data available to you, are you seeing that as a challenge from your perspective? It's, yeah, it, it's, um, it, it's definitely a challenge. People, you know, people assume it's about the data, but I think you touched on it there. The data is just the start of the journey. Like the data often isn't in the format you need. You know, it needs to be. And and for us, you know, there's a huge investment of, of time and resource in in annotating and labeling the data and rebuilding the data into a format that is appropriate for how we want to, to train train the AI. So uh, the the data is critical. Um, and it also then there's risks then around IP, which is you know given the environment we're in and it's it's moving so quickly and so fast. You know, sometimes it's hard to keep up. And um, you know. You, you have plenty of uh, advice, no doubt, on, on, on that particular area. But but there's also we, we have to think as well outside the box in some ways around well, access and exclusivity to the data uh, is is potentially you know very worthwhile to us. And the labeling and and the annotations again are are a key kind of mm. area for us. So you, you've got to think beyond just the, the traditional kind of patenting the you know IP, which in some cases is is very worthwhile, in other cases perhaps not. So so there are a range of of risks there, and even. If you step just away from the data just a tiny bit, you know, if you look at talent and the availability of talent, I mean, that's a huge risk for, I think, any anybody sitting mm -hmm. here, or probably most people in the room, like uh, attracting a uh, talent in this area in terms of data modeling, data scientists, you know, developers, etc., and retaining them is, is a huge thing, um, and and the costs are spiraling as well because it's it's massively in demand. Um, so yeah, so you know, the, the the data is 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 key, but you need people as well, uh, as well as as well as the AI. And, and just sticking there with the data, what's the outcome if the data isn't clean, if the data isn't good, if you haven't got the right data sets? It's bias. So yeah. if you think about it, I mean, I take it back to our world. You take a credit decisioning. If I don't take in the last 10 years worth of parameters, if I don't take in all the logistical information about you, or I don't take in, you know, people like you, et cetera, and that kind of thing, if I don't take into all the consideration, ultimately the credit outcome for you is, is detrimental. That's a recorded credit out outcome. So therefore, it has a long-ranging effect. So that's, I suppose, what we look at. We also look at it in terms of the way we present things. And when you're presenting it in a kind of a bias-orientated way, there's a really interesting book that I'd encourage anybody to read that kind of really wants to understand this problem around data and clean data. And it's called Invisible Women. Um, and speaking as a woman, I suppose it is a concern for me. But if you look at it, even how we build crash test dummies, even how we... Um, manufacture products in terms of uh, what you call it, heart attack um, pre prevention, et cetera, and that kind of thing. A lot of it's based on male data because it's the only data that existed. Now, that's, that's a historic problem that we can correct. But if you think about it, most data models are at least 10 years old. So actually, you have to go back quite a bit to be able to correct some of those data, data issues, et cetera, and that kind of thing. So for me, it's all about bias. It's about ethics. It's about considering the breadth of what you're looking at. And it is that idea of clean data. Mm. Mm. With all these risks, but with also the great opportunity uh, that comes with innovation, how well do you think organizations are, especially how well do you think boards are equipped to be able to make good decisions around managing those risks? So I have some stats here from a, a very good friend, a colleague of mine who, who runs a, a, an organization called the Data Strategy Alliance in the UK. And he recently did a survey of 100 of the, the UK's largest companies. It's published, it's on his website, you can go find it if you want to. Um, and that survey revealed that 9% of senior managers, so executive level individuals in the top 100 organizations in the UK, 9% of them have any technology experience at all. And less than 4% of any board member has any technology experience at all. So I'm not talking about they've got data analytics understanding or they've got machine learning understanding or they've got artificial intelligence experience. Any technology experience at all. So it's hardly surprising that when you get two or three levels down in those organizations, their chief data officer or their chief data science person is crying out for both having a lack of executive sponsorship because the executives don't understand, but also a lack of good governance. And that there aren't the right sorts of questions being asked that Nicola's talking about to make sure that those biases are managed out of data sets that are being used. And actually, we were only talking about this earlier at the break. 
from a financial sector point of view, through the regulation, they're forcing that change. Mm. So they're forcing the fact that the board needs to have that level because they recognise, like anything else, if you don't have a balanced board, whether that's you know um, what you call it from male female point of view or from backgrounds, etc., and that kind of thing, if you don't have diversity of thought, you won't have that opportunity. You won't have that challenge. And like, if you think of what a board's there for, boards are there for good governance, but for good challenge. And you can't get good challenge unless you've got that diversity of thinking. Any insights to share on this one, Jason? No. Not just from Sir Gen X, but also from you know your previous history. Yeah, I, I just I, I think I, I, the first time I'd heard those stats, I think I think they're really interesting. Um, like for me, the most important thing, well, one of the most important things for a board consideration, whether it's a small business like ours or, or a large business, it, it is very much board expertise. I've worked in large businesses and, and now in a small business and uh, you need to have that experience at board level and at sub-board level that can challenge and drive, you know, drive the initiative and so on. And it, it comes back simply, you, you can't govern and put appropriate kind of risk assessment models in place and governance models, you know, around uh, if you don't know what you don't know. It's as simple as that. Mm. Yeah. And that permeates down to an organization then as well. And, and there's that kind of, you know, lack of clarity. So I think that board expertise is, is, is really important. And I think the point you just made, Caroline, just, you know, is, is, is quite shocking in many ways. Yeah, yeah. So let's leave the audience with one piece of advice for their boards. If you could give the board one piece of advice, Jason, bearing in mind what we've talked about today, what would it be? I'd say have a look around the board table. <laughs> and uh, consider if you have the appropriate expertise at the table. And if you do, great. If you don't, you need to, uh, you need to enhance that and you need to do it you know, either directly on the board or looking to you know, uh, some kind of a advisory capacity at the very least to enhance that. Great. Caroline? I would strongly encourage setting up a shadow board. So I would strongly encourage going out and recruiting some of the brightest, the most passionate, the most driven 25 to 32 year olds in your organization or younger than that if you have younger than 25 um, there's no bottom cut off just don't nobody older than 32 <laughs> and, and put them on a shadow board and have that shadow board advise the real board even if it feels uncomfortable sometimes Nicola I'm going to be really boring and say have your defensible position so go and understand you know start questioning the data don't go on gut um, go on data Look at the data, examine it, question your people. The, you're there as a board, the people that come into you are well represented and should have the data. If they don't have the data, I don't think decisions should be made. So maybe if I could just sum up, we've got to double down on innovation. We've got to make sure that we manage the risks and the best way to do that is to have really good governance in place which has diversity of thought and the right levels of experience. Fantastic, thank you very much.